Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 106 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Dr. Richard Olson, director of the U.S. National Arboretum, all about ancient plants. And you don't want to miss his recommendations for a dinosaur-themed garden for your own. The plant profile is on gladioli, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some local upcoming garden events and some recommendations for summer garden reading. This episode, we're joined by Dr. Richard Olson, Arboretum Director at the U.S. National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dr. Olson. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Kathy. This is, this is wonderful. Thank you for joining us. So our overall topic today is going to be on ancient plants, those plants that preceded, I think, human civilization is what we'll mostly be talking about, and maybe how they took care of themselves before even human intervention, right? They didn't really need us. Right, yeah. They, <laughs> there's very few that have ever needed us. Uh, unfortunately, there's more <laughs> that need us now, but uh, yep. before us, they were doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. And But before we dive into that big topic, let's talk a little bit about you and your background, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit about the Arboretum and, and people's experiences and how to visit that. So I will say, baby Richard, dialing it way, way <laughs> back, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? Yeah, I th uh, maybe a little bit, I guess. Uh, my earliest memories were were gardening gardening in Wisconsin, where it was uh, there's pretty much three plants that come to mind: um, rhubarb in the vegetable garden, the giant rhubarb that you can, as you know, you can grow in cooler climates much better than here, and um, uh, planting silver maples at our parents' new house. I was born in 1975, just to date myself, and uh, you know, silver maples were extremely popular in the North End, still are, and. Uh, and then riding my bike through cattails and tall grass uh, prairies up there in, in Wisconsin. But uh, I, I grew up in North Carolina, which is where really where I cut my teeth uh, out in the landscape. And uh, my parents just helping out. And the real sort of hook was uh, I was really heavy in the Boy Scouts, uh, loved being outdoors. And so wanted to come up with some sort of way to, to uh, spend my life working outdoors with plants. I think a lot of our previous guests have been scouts, whether Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. So that really is a great introduction for the natural world. I was a brownie and junior myself for several years. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, growing up in North Carolina in the 1980s, it was pretty easy to get in the car and be out outdoors, out camping. Uh, and so, yeah, it was pretty seminal, but um, uh, and still involved today with with my kids. Uh, so that's uh, it's 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 great that they're having that experience as well. So. And I'm glad you mentioned rhubarb in Wisconsin and how it doesn't do so well for us here, because I do get that occasional question from Washington Gardener Magazine reader or a Garden DC listener of how to grow rhubarb in our area. And I'm like, uh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I usually tell people when when you're a streamside plant from the Himalayas, you don't do well in, in uh, Washington, D.C. So that might help uh, paint the picture. Yeah, that's that's framing it very well. So. You had a childhood, outdoor, loving plants, exploring, and then when you went to college, what was your intention with your first degree? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, long story short, but uh, yeah, my first degree was not landscape architecture. Um, uh, my first attempt was not landscape architecture, landscape design. But anyways, I found myself in horticulture and landscape design, and so the idea was, again, <clears throat> I'm not going to sit at a desk all day and, and be on a computer. I'm going to be you know, out in the field, designing landscapes, planting plants, uh, working with clients. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the first first degree is is horticultural science, NC State, landscape design emphasis. And um, the plant part was just easy for me because I, uh, the language I chose in high school was Latin of all things. And so 
you know, after uh, high school, four years, three years of, of Latin, uh, when you learn plant names, it's you, you get it. <laughs> it wasn't a struggle. It all made sense. Um, but uh, the my professor at the time, um, uh, well, I had several great professors at NC State uh, in the 1990s, um, uh, said, look, if you're going to you, you should teach or if you're interested in teaching, which I was um, in design. Uh, you should go get an advanced degree, but don't get it in landscape design. You've already got that. Get it in, get an MS um, or get a, get a PhD. And I thought, oh, okay, well. So I went down this road to get a PhD and, and fell in love during my master's with um, plant physiology, ecophysiology, the, the relationship of how plants adaptations um, make them successful uh, in their um, natural habitats, but then again, again, how you translate that into a garden. So, and then that just sort of fell into, okay, well, now I understand that. Well, let's make better plants. And so my, my PhD was in um, plant breeding and genetics. But it's interesting because one of the plants that I worked on, the, the plant I worked on for my master's is Elysium, the genus Elysium, uh, Anis family. And it's actually a plant we'll talk about today later. Great. And what was your thesis on for your doctorate? Oh, good Lord. You, it's, uh, I get the... It's the longest title ever produced at an NC State <laughs> Horticulture Department. But in short, it was um, <clears throat> uh, the it was regarding um, how to restore fertility in wide hybrids using um, um, uh, uh, mitotic inhibitors, producing fertile allotetraploids. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit involved, but basically the idea was. When you breed plants and animals, uh, you know, oftentimes they're close enough that you can cross them successfully. Think of a, a horse and a donkey and you get a mule, right? Well, we all know mules are, are sterile for a couple of reasons, but uh, that produces a, you know, a breeding bottleneck, especially in the world of plants where there's so much diversity to work with close relatives. Uh, so you have to overcome this sort of sterile uh, hybrid uh, issue. And so one way you do that is you uh, double the chromosomes, uh, restore fertility, and then continue to to breed with them. So that's sort of a, a pretty common old school technique, but we it was facilitated in, in, in the 1990s and the 2000s with really the development of some new technology, flow cytometers that allowed you to to understand the ploidy levels and chromosomes much easier than in the old days. And so, uh, yeah, and, and long story short, I was restoring fertility, fertility, uh, to continue breeding in some, some woody plants. Hmm, interesting. And so right out of college or after your doctorate, did you join the Arboretum at that stage or when did you come to the Arboretum? Yeah, uh, actually I did. I was, um, I still, you know, pinch myself. I can't believe that the, the, there was really only at the time there was only two jobs open in plant breeding or anything related to plant breeding in the in in the United States. It wasn't a, a really um, this was in the two thousands. There wasn't a lot uh, of opportunity, unfortunately or fortunately. But one of them was this position at the National Arboretum, and it was written for me. Um, it was a uh, not the director, but it was the research geneticist for the urban tree breeding program. So everything I was actually trained in doing was perfect uh, for this position at the National Arboretum to join the plant breeders and to join the staff. So I just, you know, I, the, the only thing I did between finishing my PhD and starting at the National Arboretum was, was taking a trip to the Galapagos with my wife. <laughs> so um, other than that, yeah, I've been working at the Arboretum ever since. Wow. So it's kind of like that right plant, right place um, theory, but with human beings. Yeah, it was, it, <laughs> it was very good timing. And so before we dive into our ancient trees, let's talk a little bit about your home garden. And I know listeners would like to know what you're growing yourself. What are you passionate about? Oh, my goodness. What am I passionate about? Um, this is my second garden in the D.C. area. I'm in, up in uh, Beltsville, Maryland, actually not far from the USDA ARS uh, Beltsville campus. <clears throat> and uh, I'm about, about a half acre and the uh, front yard is I'm um, working on restoring. Uh, I'm letting it's a steep slope. I'm actually working on a prairie or a, um, uh, uh, not a prairie, but uh, it's uh, wild grasses, wildflowers coming in. So I've been mm -hmm. 
uh, letting spontaneous broom sedge uh, go uh, move in, uh, spider warts I've been encouraging. So it's basically a meadow planting, uh, which is really fun. You know, nowadays, you know, when we think of ecosystem services and, and new management for, for, for gardens uh, and pollinators, uh, it's, really, it's really fun, to, uh, luxury to have that little space where I can do that. But then I, uh, in the backyard is sort of the, um, uh, protected from the deer. Uh, so I get to experiment more, but, uh, I'm actually doing a, um, a, it's kind of a, a Piedmont Oak Savannah Prairie as well in the back, uh, um, trying to do, uh, again, more grasses. Uh, I love the, the serpentine, um, natural areas that are unique to to this part of um, the mid-atlantic and studying those and looking for good plants and that that surrounds a a gravel garden uh you know the gravel gardens are pretty hot my my gravel Mm -hmm. garden is around a fire pit um so have things like uh native dwarf uh, wild petunias uh, not petunia petunia but uh, ruelia the genus ruelia seeding around and um um uh, Chrysolepis and, uh, uh, you know, it's just a little bit of everything. It's just really neat. And one side is dedicated to, uh, my love of woodland plants and, and all things either. Um, so I have a, it's, I didn't give you much specifics, but I have a little bit of everything. You're the director of the Arboretum. I'm wondering if your neighbors are like, Hmm, what type of <laughs> garden does the director of the Arboretum have? And what did they say to you about your garden? Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> they definitely know. And, um, uh, they, they, it usually comes down to, uh, advice on trees and plantings, but I'm, I, I've been spreading plants out. I, I just gave my neighbor one of the new, uh, double taker, um, uh, um, quinces, the new sort of generation of flowering quinces produced mm-hmm. by Dr. Tom Randy at NC state. Um, and, uh, uh, the, uh, um, I also have a, a new uh, flamethrower redbud, which you may know, Kathy, is relatively new, pretty mm-hmm. exciting, produced by Dr. Denny Werner from NC State. I, I know it sounds like I'm an NC State bias, but there's a <laughs> lot of great breeding, as you know, that's been coming out of there over the last 20 years. And um, But we have a lot of good gardeners. We actually have, you know, the Four Seasons Garden Club, Kathy, you're familiar with. I think there's a, a couple up the street that has a spectacular garden. So one of these days we may have a, a garden crawl uh, to share or open our gardens to everybody. Nice. That would be great. Yeah. And that flamethrower, Cercis, the red bud that you mentioned uh, is so incredible looking. So if anybody wants to Google the, a picture of that, that just looks like, you know, fire on the branches. Yeah, it's spectacular. Yeah, I came back in a minivan from North Carolina last year. It was, the kids had to move the branches out of the way so they could have room in their seats. But um, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. So, <laughs> so plants versus kids. Exactly. Right. Yep. <laughs> okay. So for our topic today, we're talking about ancient and I want to emphasize ancient meaning, not just something bred, you know, in the last few hundred years, but something that's lasted millennia uh, on the planet earth. And so maybe we'll go and dial it back to maybe what is the oldest living plant family that still is in existence maybe not the individual plant you know because i know there's trees that are thousands of years old but right, you yeah, know, yeah. the the species is the oldest right yeah well, well we'll speak sort of in general terms i guess but um yeah i mean if we the sort of premise for this was thinking you know you always hear astronomers and physicists and they talk about time traveling with when you look at starlight, right? You've got the Hubble spacecraft looking back to the origins of the universe or, or the James Webb. And I'm thinking, you know, starlight is not the only time traveler. We have hmm. plants on this planet that have been around since the, essentially um, the dawn of angiosperms or gymnosperms or, or whatever plant group. And so, yeah, plants, lower plants, mosses, algae, of course, have been around 500 million years or so. Um, but when we think about our gardens and we think about what we're growing, um, you know, the ferns uh, are some of the earliest vascular and we've talked about vascular, you know, do you have plumbing, internal plumbing that will allow you to, to grow vertical, (laughs) which is, is really what happens, right? Mosses Uh are short, algae is short. They don't have a system to get, uh, to, to move up more or less. So, Hmm. 
So with the rise of vascular plants 400 million years ago, you know, we're really talking about what you're burning in your cars, the carboniferous period, you know, the ferns, horsetails, uh, and certainly in our gardens, ferns are amazing. Uh, horsetails are amazing. A lot of people don't grow them because they're, uh, they're, they're like bamboo, they'll take over. Um, mm -hmm. But, but nonetheless, um, I think, you know, at the National Arboretum and thinking of what we grow and what we have, and again, seeing everyone visiting the Arboretum, and, and I, I don't think people realize how old the lineages of some of those trees and shrubs are. Um, and I think probably the the first one that comes to mind are that people would see and grow are the cycads. Um, and uh, of course, people would think of them as palms, but they're actually more primitive than than palms. So the, the cycad family uh, is pretty much one of the, the earlier uh, families that are still extant. And at the National Arboretum, we have the sago palm, which is pretty common in zone eight and south uh, coastal areas. Um, but we have it in the National Bonesine Pinging Museum uh, because we uh, treat that pavilion as essentially a cool temperate house during the winter, so it's protected. And uh, sago palms are used in, in bonsai as well, and they're also popular pot plants. So that's probably an, on an everyday um, higher or, you know, plant above the mosses that folks and ferns that uh, people wouldn't realize how old they are is the cycads go back about 300 million years. Wow. And when you're mentioning these plants, ferns, mosses, cycads, those are some of my favorite plants, but a lot of them I can't grow here, <laughs> especially right. the cycad. But when I'm amongst them, you know, like in a temperate rainforest, like the Pacific Northwest or elsewhere, it feels right. Like it feels natural. So I'm wondering if that's part of our Jungian memory going way back, you know, in yeah. our brains. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think back, you know, when, you know, as gardeners, we always want to grow what we can't. And I would love to grow tree ferns here. I, I've gardened in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest where you can get away with a couple. And um, so, yeah, there's something, there's just something amazing about that uh, and the primitive nature uh, of it. So, uh, yeah, I wish we could grow more. Uh, but we have a lot there. It's just, it's a group of plants. Actually, one of our retired uh, scientists uh, was an expert in liverworts and bryophytes, so lower plants. Um, so there are, there are certainly people that study and love it. And, and it's, I've been to a Japanese garden one time, uh, in Japan and they actually had a display where they labeled all of the mosses for you. Um, so that was the first garden I've ever saw that happen. Interesting. So after cycads, what would be our, our next oldest family? Yeah, I think, uh, ones that are extent, uh, would be the ginkgo. And I think a lot of people are going to be familiar with ginkgo. Uh, maybe take it for granted actually how unique that is it's it's the last of a of a lineage that goes back to uh, 300 million years ago as well you know this is with the cycads an early uh, seed plant and really saw its heyday probably 150 to 45 million years ago dispersed across the northern land masses um, but uh, it uh, now is relegated to one species, uh, one genus uh, in the entire uh, family and order that uh, is, is the ginkgo from, from China, ginkgo biloba. And Peter Crane, who is the, now the director of Oak Spring Foundation out in Virginia, incredible paleobotanist, and many people will know him as either the dean, former dean of, of the Yale School of Forestry or uh, Chicago Field Museum or in our world, um, Q, Royal Botanic Gardens Q, where he was the director. Um, he wrote a book on ginkgo, and he has a great quote. Uh, this is, there is no other living tree with a prehistory so deeply intertwined with that of our planet. Uh, so really, ginkgo and cycads share a primitive pollination mechanism. Uh, they're primitive, again, they're in the sort of the gy gymnosperms where they're, they're seeds that are not surrounded by a carpal or in a fruit. Uh, and so, yeah, ginkgo is, um, is just an amazing remnant of a, of a once widespread, um, group of plants. And I think Peter even called it the platypus of, of the plant world. Um, and what's amazing is that, uh, it persisted in, in valleys in Southeast Asia, really China, uh, and, um, became so well 
appreciate it for various reasons in, in human culture and society. It's the fruit, the nut is edible, or the seed is edible. Uh, there's a lot of sim- symbolism with the tree. Amazingly ancient specimens in, in this area, by the way, um, Tyler Arboretum, Kathy, I'm sure you're probably familiar with Tyler north of here in Pennsylvania, um, mm-hmm. has absolutely amazing specimen. I think it's better than even the one at, at Longwood Gardens. And uh, so these are very long-lived organisms. So, so ginkgo is something, common street tree. Uh, we have dwarf forms in our Gatelli, the conifer collection. Um, but yes, ginkgos are pretty amazing uh, and go back. They were they made it up in other species made it up to the last ice age. So we have fossil record in North America and in Europe. Um, but by the last ice age, um, the species went extinct in the northern hemisphere, other than the one that was left in China. So well, I always think because I love ginkgo so much that those fossil remnants that you talked about for the North American ginkgo, you know, if Jurassic Park was real. <laughs> we mm-hmm. could bring those back to life somehow. That would be so incredible to have those North American ginkgos as well. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you look at the fossil record, it's, you know, this is where one of those the terms that you'll hear, you know, living fossil, where you'll so little evolutionary change has occurred over time that when you look at the fossil record and you look at the living extent species, they're so similar. You think that they really haven't evolved or changed. Uh, but yeah, the diversity that was present in in in, uh, in in the ginkgo side of the the, the plant tree here uh, was much more in the past, and so here's what we have. And uh, yeah, not enough tissue left to uh, to to resurrect them, I guess, hmm. <laughs> in, in the fossil record, or no tissue really. So. Yeah, maybe sometime they'll dig up a mastodon with something in its stomach or something. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep looking for that. Yeah. But I was going to say, you can't, you don't fix perfect, right? Once you've got to that pinnacle, that peak of your life cycle, you just keep on replicating yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's the, it's interesting not to digress, but, you know, when you, plants are not evolving, there's no end goal, right, when you evolve, um, when you, you adapt and when you are successful in a niche and that niche is stable, then unless something disrupts it, there's no need, as long as you're reproducing and going, you know, there's, you know, there's nothing that says you have to change, uh, and so, uh, we'll come to a plant later that I think will, will highlight that, that, um, uh, as another uh, ancient lineage. Um, but uh, yeah. So. so when you're successful and you can keep reproducing and keep living and reproducing, then you've got your, you found your niche basically. Yep. 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 And then I was going to say about ginkgos, they do get a bad reputation in Washington, DC, you know, stinky ginkgos because of the, the drop fruit. Uh, yeah. And people, again, people don't realize, you know, they're separate female and male plants and, mm-hmm. uh, what the nursery industry has been doing is selecting for for male plants because to avoid that that fruit uh, it's not a fruit technically uh, we can't call it that but uh, botanically right but uh, yeah for all intents and purposes the fruit of the ginkgo um, yeah it can be quite rancid um, and uh, but it's edible seed so we, we you know you will see communities that appreciate that collecting and cleaning and roasting and if you ever travel to, to Japan or China it's not uncommon to have be served ginkgo nuts. Hmm. Yeah, it is just, I think it's like the early fall when you come around a corner in the city and that that smell hits you in the face and you're like, uh, did I step in something? (laughs) (laughs) But it's very brief period and the trees are beautiful outside of that and, and low maintenance too, aside from again, the dropping of the fruits on the sidewalk, which pretty, pretty easy to clean up after with a hose spray. Um, so you had mentioned before we jump into the next plant, the, study of paleobotany. Um, So let's talk about that for a little second. Right. Yeah. So, you know, again, I'm not a paleobotanist, so I I may get in trouble here, but yeah, really the, it's basically the, the, the study and study of ancient plants, uh, the fossil record. uh, And what a lot of people don't kind of think about is the uh, the fossil record, a lot of the really important fossil record are what would be termed microfossils. These are just plant fragments, right? It's rare for you to have a perfectly preserved fossil that has the flower, fruit, branch, bark all connected, right? So, so especially the earlier you go in, in 
in the plant record, the more that these microfossils, you're looking at pollen, particularly pollen is well preserved. Um, maybe carbonized remains uh, or fragments, leaf fragments. Uh, um, and so, yeah, putting all that together is an amazing um, really complex science to me. Um, and I can only scratch the surface of it. But the interesting thing for today's conversation with that is one of the most important historic fossil records uh, in, was the called the Potomac Group, which is named uh, for this area. Um, there is the, the formations, uh, I think it's the Patuxent, the Patapsco and Arundel clay that was all around this area where a lot of the early microfossils were being studied and, and gave us the this notion of what um, uh, the early angiosperm, in particular, we're, I'm talking about flowering plants now here, um, what it looked like. And it's interesting because just outside D.C., we're just a mile or so from the National Arboretum, is, a, is the type location for a plant called Anacostia marylandensis. So this is the genus is named after the river uh, <laughs> and named after Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. It's off of Kenilworth Avenue. No one would ever think twice. Um, and that species is in um, essentially the, the, the plant lineage, the family early angiosperms that includes uh, things like Elysium, which I mentioned earlier, I worked on in my master's, um, and uh, the anise trees. And so right here, we have this fossil record that includes um, one of, you know, an imp important record uh, right beneath our feet of what it looked like all that uh, long ago. Uh, and there's a number of things in that record that are reflected actually in, the, in our gardens today and at the National Arboretum. So um, we can jump to that because if we do, we're going to skip about uh, the evolution of conifers because we don't have all day. Uh, but conifers do go back, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, um, the, they're, uh, with the gymnosperms. They go back um, to, you know, 300 plus million years ago. Um, the joint furs. Not a lot of people know about the joint furs and ephedra, but I will just show the genus that's extent today is ephedra. And if it sounds familiar, yes, that's where ephedrin comes from. Uh, if you're from the western part of the country, you may be familiar with the plant called Mormon tea, uh, which mm. is an ephedra. These are joint furs, primitive uh, seed plants. Um, and um, actually, the one little interesting note is that one of those species, ephedra, Viridus, the green Mormon tea, was actually described by Dr. Frederick Colville, who was the first director of the National Arboretum. So uh, a little connection there. Then we were up to where you were saying that there's a connection between those plants and what we're growing in our gardens today. Right. Yes. Right. So in that plant record, if you look at the earliest uh, angiosperms, and now we're talking about um, uh, let's say the, the plants with flowers, um, showy flowers often, but um, the uh, in that record, uh, you would see uh, things that we still grow, the water lilies. Um, so the water lilies and nymph, nymph, nymphales, that, that group of plants is one of the more uh, primitive angiosperms. And, you know, when you walk at the National Arboretum and you see the pretty water lilies and and they're just magnificent. You think, well, these must be some of the most advanced plants on the on the planet because they're so exquisitely beautiful. Uh, and it's actually no, they're actually uh, date back their uh, living species of a lineage that you know really was at the dawn of the evolution of, of flowering plants. And I like that because you know a, a shout out to the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens across the river from the National Arboretum. Uh, you know, it's a great place to go in the heat of the summer um, and see see the water lilies oh yeah um, yeah i love the water lilies there and i was just gonna say i do remember a big mural and maybe this was in the uh dinosaur hall at the natural history museum downtown in dc where it shows you know kind of swampy areas and cypress trees and water lilies um so that that does make sense now that the correlation between that uh, you would also see, again, I mentioned Elysium. So it's a popular uh, group of shrubs um, in in the trade now. They've sort of had a resurgent. The anis, um, we'll call them the anise um, shrubs, I guess. Um, uh, mostly around here, Elysium floridanum, the Florida anise. Uh, and 
uh, lithium parviflorum, the yellow anis. Uh, and what's nice about these, there's, we have about two or three species in North America. There's some in the Caribbean. The rest are in Southeast Asia, so it represents this notion of disjunct genera, these plants that are found in, in, in the Southeastern or Eastern United States, and their closest relatives are in East Asia. So there's a whole history there when we talk about the, these plants and, and the spread and evolution. But, uh, you know, you see them more now uh, because I don't want to say they're deer tolerant, but they certainly... Uh, have uh, more deer, uh, I mean, deer resistant, but uh, they're certainly deer tolerant. Uh, they, they they have a little bit of a resurgence. And uh, you'll see a couple new introductions. Uh, Orion is one. Uh, but yeah, the Elysium is, a, that's a great genus and more people should be growing it. Deer tolerance makes sense because of the anise scent, I guess, in the wood itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the leaves. Yeah. So it's um, uh, heavily f- fragrant. And uh, for those of the keeping track, um, if you've ever heard of Tamiflu, uh, which is uh, 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 is derived from an anise in Asia, uh, an Elysium. So this is not the anise, the true anise uh, in the herb garden. Mm-hmm. Don't, please don't get it confused. Uh, but um, yeah, Elysium are just an amazing. And you're not, again, they, that's how I got my master's is working on Elysium. So um, it's a wonderful group of plants in uh, Native, um, the two that we, Eastern, uh, Elysium parviflorum, which is the yellow anise, uh, small flower anise, little translation, is only a couple counties in central Florida, um, but uh, hardy through zone seven. And then the uh, Florida anise, which is a showier flower, the pr- flowers look like sort of starfish, and um, is the panhandle of Florida and, and a little bit further uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, Southeastern United States. Uh, and then a disjunct population are, are related in Mexico. So, but um, very cool group of plants. Um, and I hope hope the gardeners uh, pick those up in the in the nursery centers. So mm-hmm. very cool. Yeah, I've started to see them being offered more and more in nurseries and mail order catalogs and online, of course. Yeah. But yeah, not that common yet. No, no, no. So then I have a, a weird one for you, Kathy. I, you may be familiar with it because I know you're you're an excellent gardener and plant geek like I am. Well, I'm a plant geek. You're an excellent gardener and plant geek. <laughs> I, I'm a plant geek. Excellent remains to be seen. But um, have you ever heard of the genus Chloranthus? No, it doesn't sound familiar. Is there a common name with that? I don't think it has a common name, to be honest. Uh, there's about 14 species. Mm-hmm. They're only found in East Asia. And the reason I bring it up is uh, we actually have some in the garden. Um, we have uh, at the National Arboretum, we have three species. Uh, you can find them in the, we call it the Cryptomeria Walk, the entrance to the National Bonsai and Pinjing Museum, where we have a lot of woodland natives from, from Asia and Japan. Uh, and you probably missed it in bloom. It's great little small bottle brush like white flowers. Uh, in April, more or less, uh, right when the foliage is coming out of the ground, uh, technically. Uh, and, uh, but the reason that's really interesting is the taxonomists and scientists are still trying to figure out where it fits in this early evolution of angiosperms. Some, some people will say they're closely related to the magnolias. Uh, some will say uh, they're in between magnolias and the Elysium and the water lilies. And so there's still sort of a debate on how primitive, they know it's primitive, but where, where it, it sits. And it's, it's interesting because that, that family um, is really in our, is, is widespread in sort of the earliest angiosperm fossil record. So it's either, these species are either the only things left of a widespread uh, lineage um, that was once common or, um, uh, uh, or something that was derived later. So it's, it's an interesting, uh, little herbaceous perennial that's gorgeous, uh, to me when you walk in and people will never know, um, without interpretation that, that this little herbaceous plant is causing headaches for taxonomists on how primitive it is. Uh, <laughs> there is one cultivar I know of called get shorty, which I have in my garden, um, which you can get from mail order nurseries. It's got purple flush to the foliage, and uh, so it really adds another level of aesthetics. But yeah, the chloranthus, look it up. It's a, it's a really cool group of plants. 
Um, and you would never realize how, how primitive and important it is to understand the evolution of flowering plants. And so you threw magnolias in there, which we discussed with Andrew Bunting uh, a few episodes ago, but there are, they are also an ancient family, correct? They, yeah, they are. They, they're, they're starting to, to sort of give rise to what we think of as um, they're in the magnolias. Uh, it's a, a group of family that includes um, there's magnolias. There's the, the laurels, the Lauraceae, uh, the Piperaceae, Piperace, which is actually the pepper family and, and a couple others. Um, but yeah, magnolias are, are, are primitive. You can see that flower structure where you can't tell what the different parts of the flowers are. They sort of bleed between petals, tepals, sepals, and the terminology we use. But And the other thing to just point out is in terms of primitive is the pollination structure is based on beetles. Um, and so this is at a time uh, it, before the the rapid radiation of flowering plants and the coevolution with with uh, the hymenoptera, the bees, uh, and other insects. And so beetles are primitive, magnolias are primitive. That's what that's what was getting pollinated back then. So uh, if you're a beetle pollinated flower, uh, you may be primitive. And I just always think it's funny because primitive is an insult. <laughs> in, in the rest of the world but that's in this true case, yeah yeah that, that's yeah. probably not the best word yeah yeah but uh, in this case it's just descriptive of you know something that evolved a lot earlier but right, interesting yes. yeah so yeah and at the national arboretum of course we have we have the, one of the we're part of the national the uh, plant collections network and the american public garden association it's one of our core collections it's really popular uh, and so, but yeah, magnolias are, are tip, typically thought of as, as early flowering plants. Um, so, and then another one, if, if we, I know we we maybe have to worry about time, but another early group would be the sweet Betsy's, uh, Calicanthus. I, I know you're familiar with that genus. We have a couple native in North America, one other in China. Um, mm-hmm. and then the next closest relative I believe is in Australia of all places. But uh, again, if you think of the flower of a calicanthus or a sweet Betsy with uh, that sort of often nice fragrance, sometimes uh, okay fragrance, um, strap-like, thin-like petals, again, beetle and fly pollinated, um, uh, you know, calicanthus and sweet Betsy is, is also, you could consider uh, an early um, angiosperm uh, in this group with the magnolias and lore laurels and uh, then we have a fossil record of its relatives uh in the potomac group as well so you know you're looking at calicanthus growing at the national arboretum uh, who has had relatives in essentially the same area for you know 100 million years 120 million years that's a pretty cool to think about yeah excellent so i think my next question for you would be about the home gardener who is really dinosaur crazy we'll call it because you know we have the jurassic a uh, series of movies coming out. The newest version is is hitting the theaters soon. And, you know, I know so many, I'm going to say mostly little boys, but some little girls, mm-hmm. also adults who love dinosaurs. And I've been asked by a few people about what they would put into a dinosaur themed garden. So what would you recommend? Well, I would, I would, as we mentioned earlier, you definitely need ferns. Um, the bigger, the better. Um, uh, th- those uh, would definitely uh, make it. I would, I would, you know, definitely put in a uh, sweet Betsy, a calicanthus. You get great flowers and uh, fall color. It's a, it's a native. Um, and uh, of course, if you have the room for uh, a ginkgo, <laughs> you definitely. You got to have a ginkgo, um, but we got a few other plants that people don't think about. Um, even just the our native plane trees, platanus, the sycamores. Mm-hmm. Um, that group of plants goes back 120, 150 million years. And when you look at the fossil record for the plane trees, uh, when you look at a, a fossil plane tree, uh, you can look at modern plane trees, and it's there's there's there was far more diversity back then. But um, our sycamores actually are an ancient lineage that goes all the way back. Um, one of the few that that go into Godwan land, the southern. So that so when the few representatives of a flora that is more representative of the southern continents and the southern hemisphere. So in fact, most people don't realize that for the the plane trees, their closest relatives are are the 
proteaceae, the proteas of South Africa and Australia. And by the way, another one, uh, if you have a water garden besides the water lilies we were talking about, would be just lotus. Uh, mm-hmm. Lotus and water lilies are not closely related. It's nope. uh, you think they are, but they're not. Uh, but again, um, water water a lotus would be a cool plant. And then we then after that you get into some pretty obscure stuff. Um, but we have records in 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 the Potomac group here. If you're talking about Jurassic 200 million years ago, all the way to the Cretaceous and 66 million years ago when when uh, the um, dinosaurs uh, were on their way out, thanks to an asteroid, as I understand it, then um, you would include things like even boxwood. Most people don't even think about boxwood, but the boxwood uh, family is a very primitive angiosperm. So mm. even a boxwood would technically be representative of a lineage that dates to the dinosaurs. And I imagine this would be the food of many of the dinosaurs that aren't the carnivorous ones. Right. Yeah. So it makes you wonder what, what, who, who who was distributing a ginkgo nut? (laughs) Probably would not survive a brontosaurus. Uh, But uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, you know, if you were, uh, I can't speak to, to what the trees would have looked like. And, And some of these lineages were not yet trees. They could have been shrubs or other things. So, so we think of them as trees now, but that doesn't mean they have always been trees. But mm-hmm. uh, I think ginkgo is probably, yeah, you got to, and if you have a small garden too, by the way, there are dwarf forms of ginkgos. So you can have a dinosaur garden uh, that is contained in, in a, you know, a townhouse in Washington, D.C., uh, nice. or suburbia. So, uh, in fact, we have in the National Bones and Pinging Museum, one of the specimens that I believe dates to the original gift from the people of Japan is, in fact, a, a, a ginkgo uh, specimen, uh, bones eye. Uh, that uh, we received in 1976. And that does bring us full circle to the U.S. National Arboretum and its mission. And maybe we'll give our last few minutes to talking about visiting the Arboretum and how people experience that and some of the collections. So it is a research facility as well for the USDA, correct? Right. Yeah. A lot of folks don't realize that um, the, the U.S. National Arboretum uh, was created by an act of Congress uh, to be administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1927. So we are uh, an economic garden. Uh, we uh, are a, a collections-based uh, research institute. Uh, and our job, our, our, our mission is to solve and transfer technology that's important to the American nursery and landscape industry. Now, traditionally, that has been plant breeding. So we have a long history of plant breeding where uh, we look at plant species or crops that are important to the nursery industry. And when there's a problem or a need, uh, we would breed that. We've been breeding plants much longer. Now everyone seems to be breeding plants across everywhere. Uh, but we were doing it far earlier than most folks. And a, a modern example would be boxwood. You're well familiar with boxwood blight, the fungus that's been introduced. We have the national collection of boxwood. So we mobilized with the industry and with support from APHIS and from the USDA and ARS, uh, a team across ARS um, to, to tackle boxwood blight. And our job uh, at the National Arboretum, our scientists, are working towards breeding the next generation of boxwood that may be resistance, resistant to the, the boxwood blight. Boxwood is a $120 million a year crop in the United States. And so uh, this has been devastating to that crop. And so that's our job. We step in long-term high-risk research to try to solve this problem. So even though the gardens are beautiful and the collections are beautiful and our team and staff work very hard to do that, um, at the end of the day, these these are working collections. We we use these plants to help solve uh, these these problems facing the industry. And maybe we're not even using them, but we're distributing them across the country and across the world to other scientists and other breeders that that are. So we are a repository for plants that are important to the industry. We have twenty nine thousand accessioned plants, uh, about seventeen thousand unique, and so it represents a significant part of the cultivated and conserved germplasm uh, that's important to to American gardens and landscapes. Mm-hmm. And for most D.C. area uh, citizens who would visit the Arboretum, you know, a lot of people who aren't into plants per se, they're using it as a park. Um, how do you feel about that? 
Well, it's part of the, uh, it's very important for us to, to provide that access. And that's, they're not mutual, the, the two missions are not mutually exclusive. And in reality, I would, you know, if you look at museums and, and visitors and, and how you would rank it, probably 90% of visitors to anything are not the experts. If we were only catering the National Arboretum to plant experts, uh, it would be a small group, right? Mm-hmm. Very true. So it is a very important role. We're 451 acres of open green space in a, in a heavily urbanized area. It is important, as we have found during the last couple of years, the, the ability to connect with nature and just get out and decompress. We know that, obviously, as gardeners, but the rest of the uh, population is figuring that out, which is great. And so we have nine and a half miles of, of roads uh, and trails. We have more than that in trails and, and access. And so it's a, it's really important. I mean, we struggle with visitor services and access. It's, it's just like uh, a lot of the great national parks and, and, and forests in, in the United States, you know, we, we, we struggle with maintaining that. That's not new. Uh, but uh, we have 700,000 visitors a year now. We, we've grown. Uh, we've hit over 800,000 once. And so we definitely love visitors. We just have to be able to manage it. And so uh, sometimes that is hard on plants, <laughs> right? But um, no, it's very important. We, we, that's why we exist. We exist because the American people said, we need a place like this. Uh, and then and Congress passed the act and it was signed by Calvin Coolidge. And so here we are nearly 100 years later, uh, fulfilling a, a very important need uh, for the American people. So they're not mutually exclusive um, uh, mission. And I would say that green space was super important over these past few years uh, for a lot of local citizens. That was the largest amount of green space they could access locally and, and be outside safely. Right. Yeah. No, there, at a time we were one of the few things that, that were open and it's again we had a lot of people thanking us to be uh open and um i think you know if we can mobilize all of that uh you know as we as we approach our our second centennial uh or our first centennial our second centenary uh second generation or second uh century i should say uh you know we need all the 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 fans and help we can to to support the national arboretum and it's important we have partners like the Friends of the National Arboretum and the National Bones Eye Foundation where folks can be involved, uh, be members, uh, find out what's going on at the National Arboretum. Uh, those, that public-private partnership is really important for us to leverage uh, with the funds we receive from, from Congress. So uh, we're all in it together, and I think we, we have something beautiful. It's often called the hidden gem of, of, of Washington, D.C., but I think it's been discovered. So <laughs> uh, now we got to yeah. make, make it even better. I would definitely agree. I hear that hidden gem being applied to Kenilworth, you know, water lilies and several other things. But I think I think they've discovered them now, especially your uh, property, the, the Arboretum. So for more information or how to contact you, uh, where would people find that? Yeah, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, on the web, we are at uh, www.usna.usga.gov. Um, but if you type in National Arboretum, uh, it pretty much pops up pretty quickly. And uh, through the website, we have our contacts. Uh, I'm real easy. Uh, everyone in the government is essentially richard.olson at usda.gov. Uh, or just call our front desk, too. Uh, and we'll, if you have questions or, or anything, comments, uh, we'll direct you to the right people to try to get you, get, get, get them addressed and, and answered. And uh, I'll be glad to, to answer whatever I can as well. This is the fun part of the job. And thank you, Richard. I think we only, you know, kind of tip of the iceberg is what we covered today so we have so much so we definitely want you back on the garden dc podcast to talk about more plant topics and maybe even the herbarium collection and other missions of the arboretum and as you're approaching your century mark we'll definitely be doing more coverage of that excellent excellent yeah no we've got a great great team and a lot of staff expertise here i love it i love the talk as well so if it's not me, it's going to be someone, but I, I love doing this. So I will be, I will, if you have me back, I, I will do it. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Gladiolus plant profile. This summer blooming bulb is known for its showy flowers that come in a variety of colors. My favorites are the chartreuse green, but I also enjoy the lavenders and pink blends as well. 
Gladiolus can be planted in spring after the last spring frost and come up in midsummer, about 90 days from planting. After that, it will behave as a perennial in your garden if you mulch it well. Be sure to plant the bulb deep enough and give it extra winter protection if you're in zone 6 or lower. Gladiolas require full sun for best blooming and may need some staking if they are not supported by surrounding plants. After blooming, remove the faded flowers and then cut the whole stalk down. You can also cut the stalk when just a few blooms are open to enjoy the rest as they open up in your indoor arrangements. Gladiolus, you can grow that. What's new this week? Well, over at the community garden, it's been a soggy one. So I've tried to stay out of the oversaturated soils and am holding off on doing some of my summer planting but I'm still harvesting strawberries and weeding a bit, checking on the garlic and carrots as they develop. And finally, finally, I have flowers forming on my snap peas, so I should have peas soon. Also the thornless blackberry is forming tons of fruit, so I'm looking forward to having that ripen in a few weeks. And I spotted some self-sowing zinnia and celosia seedlings I will be moving those around to a better spot since, of course, they popped up right where I want to plant my tomatoes. In my home garden, I am enjoying the last of the peony blooms that didn't get shattered in the storms. My roses are looking especially wonderful this week and they are enjoying all the extra moisture. And I've been cutting blooms to enjoy inside of my mock orange because that scent is just so intoxicating. I want to give a quick shout out to listener Jack Bosma for your wonderful voicemail message and to all of our listeners for your support and feedback. And one thing I wanted to share is some summer reading choices. So as we were going into Memorial Day weekend and jumping into summer, I thought some garden reading recommendations might be in order. There's a wonderful book by Mary-Kate Mackey and Kathleen Norris Brenzel, The Healthy Garden, Simple Steps for a Greener World, easily digestible chapters on sustainable gardening that are just wonderful. Next is Garden Variety. It's a novel, so it is fiction by Christy Wilhelmy, and that is about the adventures of the residents around a community garden and the community garden that they garden together in. So check that one out for some fun beach reading. And then for some more practical gardening information, I'm recommending my friend Kim Roman's book, How to Garden Indoors and Grow Your Own Food Year Round. And that one is a great one, especially if you are in an apartment or don't have extensive places to grow edibles. She has really fun and inspiring options for that. So you can find the book reviews for that in our May 2022 issue of Washington Gardener magazine. And all of those books, of course, are available on Amazon and Bookshop and wherever you find great gardening books. And some upcoming events to let you know about. We are going to be at Valley View Farm on June 5th and that is a Q&A garden book party from 2 to 3 p.m. Valley View is in Cockeysville, Hunt Valley, Maryland just outside of Baltimore and we is Kathy Jens, myself and Terry Spate, my co-author. We're going to be selling and signing our book The Urban Garden and Terry will be signing and selling her book Black Flora and Kim Roman who I just mentioned will also have her book How to Garden Indoors with her as well for signing and selling and we'll be answering your gardening questions. And then on June 18th, which is also a Saturday at 2 p.m., I will be giving a talk on Can't Fail Containers at Patuxent Nursery in Bowie, Maryland. During that talk, I will be putting together a container, um, mixed container, and then at the end, 
of that talk and demonstration, one lucky winner will be selected to take home that demonstration planting. Uh, it's free to attend. You can find out more about that at PatuxentNursery.com. Happy gardening! In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden, 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City, comes out this spring. You can pre-order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.